All right, so we'll, we'll start at the, uh, the very beginning. Uh, what was your relationship like with your parents? So what was it, what was it like growing up? What was it like growing up? Well, I feel I had a very um, great childhood. Um, my father worked very hard. Uh, my mother took care of, you know, the house, the kitchen, and uh, she was very well known in the community. Um, everybody, everybody knew her and respected her. Um, <clears throat> we lived, we didn't live in the middle of the Jewish community. We lived slightly outside in the very next, well, in Louisiana was called a parish instead of a county. And there were not many Jewish people there. The, the bulk of the Jewish community was, you know, in town. Uh, um, so we were, we were in some ways kind of outsiders. Um, at least I was. There weren't a lot of Jewish kids in my school. I was usually the only Jewish kid in my class. Um, you know, it was local, the local public school. There were no... There were no Jewish day schools uh, at that moment. And um, I was pretty free as a kid. Uh, nobody asked me where I was going or what I was doing. Um, I was the youngest of four, four children. My closest sibling was Uncle David, who was uh, uh, about three years older than me. And uh, we didn't have a real close relationship. I think he kind of resented me. You know, I was the youngest. And so, like your dad, <laughs> everybody thought the youngest is, is, is uh, spoiled, you know, and gets their way and whatnot. Uh, I think that's what he thought about me. And as we got older, sometimes he had to stay home and babysit. And he didn't like that. Um, but um, a lot of times I, I uh, made my own way, you know, I, in the summertime. I never complained, oh, I'm bored. You know, I don't think my mother would have paid any attention to me if I said I'm bored. There were, <clears throat> there were no summer camps, uh, day camps and all of that kind of stuff. It just was a very different time. And you were just expected to, you know, find something to do. Uh, as I say, there were not... There were not kids in my neighborhood, um, and um, I just found things to do myself, and you know, was never unhappy about it. Um, um, I feel like I had a really great childhood. I didn't didn't want for anything. Um, I didn't have a lot of toys, and, and of course, there were no electronics and all of that kind of thing. Um, I remember games like uh, Chinese checkers, cards, regular checkers. Um, I had I had one doll. I wasn't particularly crazy about dolls. Uh, I remember liking uh, jigsaw puzzles, and uh, a big treat was something called the uh, uh, what was it called? It was a book, a pa paper dolls. So you would get a book. And you would have the figure of a of a girl usually, and then the rest of the pages were um, cut out clothes and outfits and things. So you could spend, you know, a lot of time just very carefully cutting out the um, the, the clothes, and and they always had little tabs that you could put on the on the figure. And uh, so summer was spent, you know, just kind of hanging out. As I said, there were very few Jews in the neighborhood. And so I didn't have a lot of what you would call playmates. Um, so what I did, did you have a bike. What? What, what? what was like your main thing you did for fun when you were young? What I do for fun? Well, I guess it depended on what, 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 how old I was. Uh, um, the family used to take our bikes and we would ride to Lake Pontchartrain, which was, I guess, maybe a three or four mile ride, I guess. 
and we would go to the lake and and swim in the lake. Um, we, I, 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 sometimes I, my bro, my uh, uncle Joe, my oldest brother, would take me to the movies, and I don't know somehow he kind of snuck me in for free or something. I don't know exactly how that worked, but I remember going to the to the movies, uh, not often, but you know sometimes. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, like I say, I read a lot. Uh, a lot of times in the summer, especially, I was really by myself. My sister was was older. You know, she was like uh, seven years older, so she had completely different interests than I did. And then, of course, Uncle Joe was that much older than that. So, um, like I say, sometimes I just sort of amused myself and... Um, Played out in the yard. I had. I remember one summer building a uh, a little uh, construction uh, roadways and things in some kind of dirt place and put water in it. And I don't know. I just found things to do, and uh, it was very warm and muggy. So a lot of times I was outside. You know, I'm talking about the summertime yeah. when I wasn't in school. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember being unhappy or sad or any of that. Um, you know, of course, Friday night was very important. And uh, I didn't have a lot of jobs to do around the house. Uh, you know, we had this, this woman named Zetta who <clears throat> was with the family for about 35 or 40 years. Well, she was there before I was born. And... Um, I used to talk to her um, sometimes. Uh, she would send me. She would send me to the drugstore to get stuff for her on the bicycle. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, you mentioned that uh, Friday nights were very important, which obviously they should be. Uh, so uh, what what was the uh, what was the Shabbat of? Can you hear me? What was Shabbat? What? what? What was the Shabbat observance like? And like, and your like a religious experience of being a Jew in you said a neighborhood with not so many Jews. Well, you know, it was uh, it was a normal Friday night. You know, my father made kiddush. Uh, my mother lit the candles. We had a nice dinner. Always nice tablecloth, uh, silverware, polished, of course. Did you hear that? Yeah, I hear it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a great dinner. My mother was a wonderful cook. And, um, you know, everybody had to be there. You know, there wasn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't go whatever. And uh, it was like, you know, a, a real, you know, a real Jewish Friday night. My parents uh, talked about, News of the day, I remember during World War II, you know, of course, I was really young and I didn't really know what they were talking about. I, I knew there was something bad going on about Jews, but, and something bad going on, but um, uh, I didn't really, I didn't really know, I didn't understand most of it, um, <clears throat> but it was a very, very special Friday night and we didn't, we never went to shul on Friday night. Of course, the synagogue was was in town, so it was a long way away, and um, you know we 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 never we never went on Friday night. Yeah, and then um, just in terms of like uh, I remember like you sent me uh, the writing of uh, what you did on Passover, and like uh, so what were were holidays also a very important important part of the uh, the calendar for you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, very much so. Especially Passover just got to be really crazy. I, I think I, I think you read that thing I wrote about Passover. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what it was like. It was just, yeah. you know, everything topsy turvy, and everybody, you know, my mother and and this woman Zetta, and then she a lot of times she hired somebody somebody extra to help with some of the stuff. And I remember curtains being out outside drying. Of course, there were no there were no you know, 
dryers and washing machines like we have now and everything just a mess. I hated it. I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one funny thing happened during Passover one year. My, my father <clears throat> didn't allow us to have comic books or paperback books. He said, if something is good enough to be published, it should be in a hardback. So the only thing then being published in paperbacks were kind of smutty novels and um, I don't know what, because we never had, a, I never saw a pa paperback in my house. Never had one. We had lots and lots of books, but no paperbacks. And so, and we weren't supposed to have comic books. He said they were a waste of time. If you want to read something, read something good. So we weren't allowed to have comic books, but of course we did it anyway. And so I used to hide them under the mattress in my, on my bed. So when Passover came one year, they flipped the mattress and there they were. So, uh, my mother, my mother wasn't, wasn't quite as crazy about the comic books as, as my father, but she kind of must have, I don't remember what she said to me, but um, I don't know. It kind of passed. I guess she didn't tell my dad that I had a stash of comic books under my bed. <laughs> yeah. And would you say that your parents were like pretty strict? Were they good? Like, you know, what, what are your memories of your parents? Well, my father was not a, 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 a huggy, huggy kind of person. Um, he was an old fashioned uh, man who wouldn't marry my mother until he had enough money in the bank. And the thought of, of him marrying somebody who had to go to work was just absolutely out of the question. I mean, it wasn't even a conversation. It was a different time, you know, everything was quite different then. And so I uh, had uh, very strong views about things and he let you know um, how strongly he felt about things. Um, education was like number one. Uh, you, you, were, you were expected to do your homework, nobody Nobody helped you with your homework. Nobody said, have you done your homework? You were just expected to do it, period. Um, he worked very hard. He was very smart. He was great in math. He was an engineer. So he was very smart in math. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes I remember asking him questions, but not a lot, not a lot. Um, my mother, on the other hand, was much softer personality. Um, and nobody was real fuzzy huggy in those days. Um, uh, just wasn't, just wasn't the way it was. I, I remember sitting in my father's lap when I was little. I remember doing that. Um, not that they were, you know, that he was, you know, mean or stern or abusive or anything. It was just a personality thing. And I think that's the way men saw themselves in those days that that you you weren't supposed to be uh, uh soft uh you, you were supposed to be strong and you were the man of the house and you know that kind of macho they didn't call it of course they didn't call it macho in those days but uh, i never felt unloved i never felt you know i never got i remember one time I remember one time I said something very, very dirty. I don't remember what I said. And they tried to wash my mouth out with soap. I mean, literally, with a bar of soap. I remember that. I don't know what I said or what I did, but it was, must have been something. So you just knew what the rules were and, and, uh, and knew there were consequences if you didn't follow the rules. And... It was just very matter of fact, um, but uh, I never felt nobody loved me. I never felt, you know, insecure. I never felt uh, that anything bad was going to happen to me. Um, as I say, I, I'm very, I feel like I was very privileged. Yeah. And um, uh, so uh, moving on to like the rest of your family with, um, uh, with your siblings, like, who, who would you say you were, you were closest with? You said uh, Uncle David might have had a little bit of resentment for you being the youngest. Like uh, who would you say like was your closest sibling? 
Well, I guess, I guess Uncle Joe, the oldest, was my closest sibling because uh, he, he resented, you know, family dynamic, dynamics in a big family always are very complicated. So he resented my sister, who was only about 18 months younger than him. And she was the goody two-shoes of the family. You know, she never got in trouble. Uh, she worked really hard in school and did really well. And, and uh, in, in some ways, I think she was my father's favorite, if you could say he had one. Uh, and so she and I, as I say, there was like seven years, six and a half, seven years difference between us. So we were really never very close when we were growing up because she was so much older and I was just pesty. And, you know, I just kind of, uh, I don't remember being really close, although we shared a room, uh, you know, our bedrooms would, we, we shared. Um, but it was, it was never very close until, of course, we got older and both lived here in Atlanta. Um, but I guess I could say that my oldest brother was, uh, we were sort of in cahoots against my sister, could put it that way. Uh, so, you know, family dynamics, like I say, when there are a lot of people, it kind of waxes and wanes and different alliances, but, but, uh, Saturday afternoons, we were all together and that's when we played cards. We, uh, we played telephone jokes. Did I would tell you about the telephone jokes we played. So my parents sometimes would visit other people or something. And sometimes, many times on Saturday afternoon, they weren't home. So we would take the telephone and it had, we had one telephone and it was a stand up telephone. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen them. It's a long, it was on a stem and the dial was on the bottom. It was a dial phone, of course. And you had, you picked up the receiver. Oh Yeah. Have you ever seen a phone look like that? I've seen them on TV shows. Yeah, okay. So, so we would take the telephone, had a very, very long cord, I remember, and we'd get the, um, the telephone book, and you'd open the telephone book, just random, and you take a pin, close your eyes, and just go to some spot in the telephone. And then we'd play telephone jokes. So my brother... Joseph was the oldest, so of course he had the deepest voice. So he would call up, he would say, This is the water department. Is your is your bathtub running? No. Well, we're testing the water. I I don't remember all the conversation, but we're testing the water. You go turn on your bathtub. And I go turn on the bathtub. And then he'd say, that say, then he'd say, Well, is your is your bathtub running? And they say, yes. He say, go catch it. And then it hang up. Did you get the joke? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were harmless. They were completely harmless. They were harmless jokes. Uh, or then he would, uh, another one I remember, there was, a, uh, <clears throat> there was a famous tobacco. A lot of men those days uh, smoked. Of course, my father smoked like a chin. The, uh, this chain smoke. Sometimes he smoked a pipe, and uh, there was a fast tobacco, and it was in a red can, kind of like a tall, skinny can like that. And it had a print, a picture of Prince Albert. Prince Albert was the husband of Queen Victoria in England. You heard of Queen Victoria? Yep. Okay. So that was her husband, and so it was a picture of this, you know, this man from the late. 19th century on the cover, you know, very, you know, the, the typical dress of the time. So the, the, the other telephone joke I remember, he'd say to somebody, um, do you have Prince Albert in a can? Well, everybody knew what that was. It was a tobacco. And if they said yes, he'd say, oh, well, you better let him out. <laughs> and then you just hang up, you know, after you said the punch line, you hang up. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's pretty mischievous. Morning. What? Pretty mischievous. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, we were, we were kind of rambunctious all when all of us were together. We played, like I said, we played a lot of cards. We played, we played hearts, and then we played a game called Black Widow or something like that. I can't remember the 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 um, the rules of all the games. And then we played something like called strip poker. So if my sister and I knew we were going to play strip poker, do you know what that is? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. So we would go before we knew we were going to do that, or if we had an inkling that that was what was going to be the game, we would put on like four pairs of socks and <laughs> three pairs of underwear and all that kind of stuff, or two shirts. And uh, we did that. And, um, we play ping pong. We take the dining room table that had a couple of leaves in it and, and make it as big as it could and set up the net on the dining room table and play ping pong. And, um, like I say, we play, we work puzzles, um, played cards, played telephone jokes. Um, just kind of wild away the time on Saturday afternoons. And so when we were all together like that, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of fun. Um, we just sort of entertained each other. As I said, there were very few kids in the neighborhood period, much less Jewish kids. So we just sort of, um, we're a gang of four. We entertained each other and, uh, we did have a radio, but I don't remember, I don't remember listening to the radio. Of course, there was no TV. Um, those are some of the things I remember. Yeah. And then, um, obviously you didn't know any different, um, in New Orleans, but, uh, like what was, um, I guess like what was life like, and especially now like looking back, what was like different from, uh, you know, other places? Oh, living in New Orleans? Yeah. Um, oh, it was exciting. It was very exciting. You know, when I got older and I was on my own. You know, I'd go downtown with a friend and we'd wander around the French Quarter. There was always um, some kind of an exhibition or something special going on. Uh, uh, I had a friend who's, who, I think I told, I told your father this. I had a friend from school whose father was the manager of the Monteleon Hotel where your father stayed, father and mother stayed when they went to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah. So it's a, it's an old hotel been there for years and years, right on, right in the French quarter, very famous place. So her father was the manager of the hotel. And sometimes she would invite us, me and other people would come down there and we'd go on the roof and it was a flat roof and we would sunbathe on top of the, on top of the hotel and the hotel, the roof <clears throat> had little, um, some kind of little pebbles, uh, that was part of the roofing material. It wasn't like slate or something shingles or something. And so one day, one day we decided that, um, we would just drop some pebbles over the, over the roof onto the street. And it's about maybe seven, eight stories high. And so we'd just walk over to the edge and drop one of these pebbles. They were tiny little pebbles. I mean, what rocks? They were little pebbles. I mean, really little pebbles. And we'd drop them over the side one at a time. And, you know, just, just to, <laughs> I don't know why we decided to do that, just to see what would happen down below. And <laughs> so pretty soon after, I don't know, a half an hour, this, her father came up on the roof and he said, what's going on up here? And we said, I don't know. He, I said, why? He said, well, because um, people down on the street are coming into the hotel and saying there's something falling off the roof. And so we just fainted in ignorance and, you know, shrugged our shoulders and said we didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a fun place. It was a fun place, you know, especially as I got older and I was – really on my own could go do and do it. You know, there was not such a thing as a helicopter parent. You know, when you got to be a certain age, you know, the public transportation cost seven cents. 
So you could get on the bus and the streetcar and you would usually just go downtown, which is called where all the shopping was and the main street canal street. And, uh, you know, if you had a dollar or something, you could go into Woolworths, the, the five and dime store and buy whatever, however long the, the dollar lasted. Uh, um, I just remember my young teenage years, I was on my own. And um, besides go, having to go to Hebrew school six days a week, uh, you know, and then when I was in high school, I, I wasn't going to Hebrew school any longer. So I was pretty free to do what I wanted. And yep. so New Orleans was, a, was an exciting place, you know, not just Mardi Gras, but just walking down the street, going to the, all these little crazy shops that one shop said sold nothing but buttons, another shop sold nothing but pipes, another shop sold tarot cards. You know what tarot cards yeah, are? Yeah, I do actually, yeah. <laughs> you do? Yeah. yeah my, my so there was a lot of, of voodoo. I remember there was a voodoo shop, and uh, I'm sure there was marijuana going on there, but, you know, nobody paid any attention to it. And, of course, there were a lot of, it was a big hub for, for gay men, especially, and maybe women too, but nobody talked about that. And so I kind of grew up with, with, you know, gay people around and uh, never paid any, never paid, never, they never bothered anybody and nobody bothered them. Um, so, you know, when all the homophobia stuff started, I said, well, what is the deal here? I mean, these are the, these people are who they are, period. And so who cares? Um, so it was a free city. You know, of course, the bars were open almost all day long. And, you know, um, not that I cared about. Even I'm sure I asked you for an ID. Nobody cared. Um, there was a drink in your hand and, or going into all these jazz places and so it was it was a pretty exciting place it really was it was i think it was pretty safe um i don't remember a lot of a lot of of uh violent stuff but you know for a teenager you only care about yourself you're not really concerned about a lot of stuff so maybe it went on maybe it didn't i don't know but they don't call it the big easy for now you know that's the that's sort of the uh, the tag name for New Orleans, or became Big Easy because everybody just sort of did their thing and minded their own business. I think uh, you know I'm sure there were problems, but I was pretty oblivious to it. I'm sure. Yeah, and um, then uh, you you mentioned um that the, there are a few ja like there are lots of jazz places um in the city. And I was wondering if, like, if jazz played at all a part um, in your life. Not really. Not really. I knew what it was, and I knew, I knew it was a, you know, the city was a big hub for it, but uh, not really. You know, I knew it was there, and I kind of enjoyed listening to it when I did. But uh, 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 we, we were in the musical family. Nobody. Nobody had a great voice. Nobody played a musical instrument. Uh, so we weren't really a musical family. So, uh, you know, that, that wasn't jazz was, you know, everybody knew what it was and everybody knew that there was a lot of it in, in the city, but it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say it was a big part of our lives. Got it. Um, so uh, uh, this is just a real quickie, but uh, how did you get your name? Oh, where, where did my name come from? Yeah. Well, my name, my given name was Doris Lee Harris. So my mother's mother's name was in Europe, Deba, a Yiddish name, and she became Dora in, in, in America. And her father's name was uh, Yoel Leb. And so when he came to America, at some point, he became Lewis. So they just took the two initials, D.L. and Doris Lee became my name. Got it. 
Um, and uh, so you were mentioning um, about your uh, your high school experience earlier. So uh, what what was uh, what was high school like? And uh, I don't know, like uh, what how is it different from now? And what were your favorite subjects? Well, <clears throat> the high schools uh, in in New Orleans at the time that I started high school were single sex schools. So for three, the first three years of my high school, I um, I was in an all girls school, not religious, you know, it was a public school, but the girls were in one school, the boys were in another school. So I was in uh, this high school that, that uh, <clears throat> um, it was, I, I guess it was a fairly good sized school. You know, you don't, you just don't pay attention to, well, how many people are in this school? Was it 300? Was it 500? I don't know. You know, I knew people in my class. So, <clears throat> so it was all girls school. I remember wonderful teachers. Um, it was, uh, they, they were, you know, I guess you would call it an academic high school, although there were kids there, I'm sure from all walks of life but there were a number of jewish kids in this was not in the parish that we lived in we kind of illegally went to the wrong school because the, the high school uh, in in my where i lived was was my parents didn't think it was a very good school and so we kind of gave somebody else's address in the city so i could go to the high school <laughs> and uh, uh even, even at, I think at about fifth grade, I changed to a, a city school from the from the, the local school again, giving another address, an aunt who lived in the city, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, I remember wonderful teachers, really dedicated teachers. I remember one anti-Semitic teacher, although I didn't know it at the time. This was in like maybe sixth, seventh grade. And uh, <clears throat> I, well, one of the assignments after Mardi Gras vacation was to write an essay or write something about Mardi Gras. So I wrote this essay about the black uh, parade called Z Have you ever? Grant, I couldn't hear what you just have, said. Have, did you hear me? Wait, say I it said, again. I wrote an essay. I wrote an essay about this black parade. There were uh, black people had their own parade and it was called Zulu. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, so I wrote this essay about the Zulu parade and um, she accused, she accused me of having my mother write it. And I was so offended. I didn't realize at the time, you know, why. Um, but now, you know, thinking about it, I remember other things that, that I did in her class that I knew were, were good and she always criticized them. You know, it was always something wrong or she didn't give me, you know, what I, I knew, you know, you know, when you go to school, you know, when you do something well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you just know that's that something's good and um she never she never gave me the the, 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 the i guess the, the encouragement of of knowing that it was good but i didn't I, i'm sure that's what it was because i didn't i didn't misbehave or you know any reason why she didn't like me you know there was nothing about me i don't think that would make her not like me me but of course she knew i was jewish even though my name wasn't a jewish name but whenever i was absent for the holidays my mother had to write a note saying that if she, i was absent on such and such a day to observe a jewish holiday a religious holiday so she knew you know she had to know so but but she was a good teacher she was very strong very strict but she was a good teacher so i would think that that most of my teachers were really very good um, and, uh, I had a really good, a really good, uh, public school education. Yeah. 
And um, uh, how did you get to school? On the bus, streetcar. Oh, there was a bus because you said it was in a well, different district, so I wasn't sure if. Um, no, it was a public. It wasn't a school bus. There were no oh. school buses. No, I had to transfer because I lived a good way away. I had to take uh, to 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 till eighth grade. I had to take one, two, three buses, three bus streetcars to get to school. And then in high school, I had to take another one, an extra one. So I had to transfer twice to get to, to, get to grammar school and then three times to get to high school. Wow. And I went by myself. You know, I had seven cents. Sometimes I... In, in the lower grades, I, I rode about my bike to school. Um, but if it was cold and, you know, raining or something, I didn't do that. But, but I remember riding my bike. I don't remember how long it took me. The school must have been uh, maybe six, seven miles away, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> my bike. Um, but most of the time, what I remember was was the streetcar, rode the streetcar, the bus yeah. and the streetcar. Cool. Um, yeah, it was like I say, it was very you know. And when I went when I went to Hebrew school, I did the same thing. I I rode five but four transfers to get to Hebrew school because again we lived away. We didn't live right in the middle of things, and there really wasn't a real. Jewish community. You know, New Orleans never had a big Jewish community to begin with, and it was all scattered around, um, and we didn't live anywhere near it. Uh, so whatever, whatever we were doing, we, it, was, it was a schlep, but, um, you know, that was just the way it was. You just did it. That's all. Yeah. And what were your, um, your academic interests entering college? Uh, <clears throat> well, I always liked history. And English, um, those were the two main ones, I would guess. Um, so I was an English major. I wasn't an education major. You know, a lot of people in those days, girls, uh, majored in education. There weren't that many things that were open or the usual things for women. And, you know, the idea was that, that you were going to get married anyway. And that you weren't necessarily going to work. Again, still, it was almost the same thing as my father's generation, where where um, you know, a woman got married and and didn't didn't really expect to work. Uh, uh, certainly not to support her husband, uh, or to even you know, you, you. It was just a time where where the expectations were very different. And society was completely different. So we're all we're all creatures of our society, even though we think that we're so independent. But we're all creatures of our society. And uh, so I didn't I didn't ever think I wanted to teach school, but I loved reading. I loved I loved literature, and I loved I loved history. And so those were my two big interests. But I, I declared that I was an English major. That's, that was what I did. And how did you make your decision to go to Sophie Newcomb? Well, it really wasn't my decision. It was my father's decision. Because I wanted to go to, to, to LSU, which was this big state school. It was about 90 miles away in Baton Rouge. It was about 90 miles away from New Orleans. And I just thought, well... You know, that would be fun, you know, with football and et cetera, et cetera. And so I told him I wanted to go to LSU. And I mean, going, going out of state or going up north or something, completely out of the question. You just, you just didn't even, you didn't entertain that. That was not, that was not something you entertained. If you, if you didn't have any money, you know, people from the lower you know, lower middle class people, they went to LSU if they went at all. And of course, a lot of them didn't even go to college at all. They went to a trades, there were trade schools in New Orleans. There were secretarial schools. 
you know, where women learn to be secretaries. Yeah. Um, a, a girls went to nursing school, which was in the, usually a lot of times in the hospital, you know, the hospitals, not as necessarily affiliated with a medical school, but just in the hospital, they had their own nursing school. So uh, a lot of young women went to Japan, which was a, a, it was like hieroglyphics. Do you know what hieroglyphics are? Yeah, the Egyptian writing. Right? Symbols, you know, symbols for words, yeah. pictures for words. And so there was this thing called, called um, shorthand. And it was, uh, so if you were a secretary and the boss called you in to take a letter or something, you had a notebook and a pencil and he, he said what he wanted to say, and you wrote down the series of symbols, and then you typed it, you know, you knew what it said. So a lot of girls did that. So anyway, I told my father I wanted you. So he looked and he pulled out of his pocket seven cents, a nickel and two pennies, and he said, here, he said, you're gonna take the bus and you're gonna go to Newcomb. At the end of the conversation, that's how I decided to go to Newcomb. <laughs> he well, said, he said, you have this great school right in your backyard. And that's what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Period. That was it. I guess that makes sense. It was a short conversation. And um, now just going a little bit back, you mentioned a little of this before, but did you take any uh, family trips when you were younger? Uh, no, no, well, no, not really. Um, you know, part of the time when I was growing up was wartime. So nobody was going on family trips. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we had a, we had a house across Lake Pontchartrain. And by the time I was born, they, they had already had this house for several years, I guess. Because I remember my mother telling me I learned to walk while one summer in this house. And so <clears throat> for several years, the family would go across the lake in the summertime to this house. And Zeta, this woman who worked for us, would come with us. And then my father would come back on the weekends and he would spend the weekends there. And so we would just hang out. You know, I was little but I still have very fond memories of it, uh, roaming around the beach and going to the water and I don't know what we did anyway. So that was, I guess you could say a family trip. Um, but we didn't, we didn't all pile in the car where we, well, during the war, of course, we didn't have a car. My father still had a truck. Matter of fact, I learned how to drive on this truck. And, you know, a big stick shift in the floor. Um, and that's how I learned to drive when I was like about, I think, I think I could get a license at like 14, maybe. Really? I think. Wow. I, I don't, maybe 15. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I have something like that. It was, I was pretty young. Um, <clears throat> so no, we didn't take family trips. There was no, no such a thing. Uh, and of course, our ages were so were so different. You know, by the time I was like ten, my brother, my oldest brother, was eighteen. He was in college, you know, and so our ages were so such, such disparity in ages that nobody even. I I didn't even know anybody who did that. I don't know if people did that then. Um, I took one trip with my mother. Uh, my mother had a, a brother who lived in outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And one summer he decided to drive from Memphis to see relatives that we had in Philadelphia. And, and they took me with them. So my mother and her brother, my mother's, my father, my, my uncle's wife and me, we went on this trip. And we drove uh, from Memphis to uh, first to Philadelphia and then to New York and Atlantic City and 
a couple of other, I think that was about it. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever see a mount, seen a mountain. <laughs> we drove through West Virginia, the beautiful countryside, great big mountains and covered in gr grass and things. And it was, uh, it was just startling to me. Uh, you know, New Orleans is just as flat as it can be. The only mountain in New Orleans was one, something in a park called a monkey hill. <laughs> and it was an artificial hill that they had built. And you just, you, if you had a bike, you could take the bike up to the top and race down the bottom. And uh, that was the only hill I'd ever seen. So I thought that was really very exciting to see a mount to see mountains. The other funny thing about on about that trip is that we passed, you know, on the road you pass cemeteries. And of course in New Orleans, except for Jews, everybody's buried above the ground. So I kept seeing all these little country cemeteries and whatnot. And of course everybody was buried in the ground. So I just figured there are a lot of Jews there <laughs> because they were all buried in the ground. And I said, Oh, I thought to myself, wow. That's interesting. You know, that just shows you how what you grow up around gives you such a such a perspective on the world. You know, you just think you know what things look like. And yeah. and you just relate it to what you already know. And it may be something completely different. Yeah. That's really interesting, Grant. Um so uh you you know a lot about your family history so we and we won't like uh talk too long about it because um that, that that could take a long time but um i i just wanted to know um like some of like the the broad strokes of like uh what uh your grandparents were the immigrants to um to america correct yes both grandparents were immigrants yes um so what do you know about their lives um before coming to america and then how like just like a few like broad things you can tell me about uh, how they came here I know nothing about their lives before coming to America. Absolutely nothing. And of course, I never asked, and people didn't talk about that stuff. Um, <clears throat> I know nothing about other relatives they may have left, you know, in Europe when they came. I, I have a lot of ideas about what must have, where they must have come from. Well, I know they all came from Eastern Europe, except my father's mother came from Hungary or the greater Austro-Hungary Empire, which was a huge, a huge area before World War I. And so I know that's where she came from because he used to talk, he, he used to talk about um, that she, she wanted, this is a couple, just a couple of things he used to talk about, that she, that she wanted an education and, you know, girls just, didn't thought, thought Philo owned to that. And so he talked about her standing outside of her brother's uh, a school, listening in the window, uh, how old she was, where it was exactly. I have no idea. Um, my grandfather was born in Liverpool. And I am sure that his parents were both Eastern European Jews who left left wherever they came from and wound up in Liverpool, which was a, a port city. <clears throat> it still is a port city. And he was born there. Uh, whether they planned to continue to come to America and then didn't have any money, you know, for the ship and just decided to stay, which had an old Jewish community, I don't know. But he left there when he was like, I don't know, an older teenager. And how he met my grandmother in Philadelphia, I have no idea. But they were married actually in Philadelphia. And my father was born in Philadelphia. Huh. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and, my, and my mother's parents wound up in Galveston, Texas, which is kind of an unusual place. In those days, you know, you think that immigrants came to Ellis Island and they came to, you know, big port cities like that. But they wound up in, in uh, Ellis Island, I mean, in, in Galveston, Texas. And um, <clears throat> the, the, the famous story in the family is, is that 
they had not been there very long. And my mother, my grandmother, um, my grandfather said that he would, he would do the, like the, the meat shopping. He would find, he would find meat and bring it home. You know, uh, I imagine he was a peddler, a merchant of some kind that, you know, scraping a living. And, uh, one day she found out that he was bringing home trace meat because there was no kosher meat in, in, in Galveston at that moment. Although there was a Jewish community and there was, there was a synagogue still there. And so she said to him, we're leaving. We're not staying here. I'm not living in a place that you can't find kosher meat. So they went to Omaha, Nebraska. Why Omaha? Well, you know, it's such a weird place to go. Yeah. But there was some kind of a cousin there. I, I, a mo my mother's, somebody in my mother's family, my grandmother's family, who she knew, was living in Omaha, Nebraska. So they went to Omaha, Nebraska, and were there for a number of years. I don't know exactly how many, but my mother's two older sisters were actually born in Omaha. And then early in the 19th, the 20th century, I don't know exactly when, well, no, even before that, they moved to Memphis. Why did they move to Memphis? I have no idea. Absolutely none. And that's where my mother was born, and that's where her two younger brothers were born. And did you but have as them? As far as what happened in Europe, who, who was there, where they came from, the meager stuff, that's all I know. Yeah. And not, not surprising. Uh, like, most people didn't never talked about it, so... No, and of course, and of course, you didn't ask. You didn't think to ask about it. You know, it wasn't it wasn't anything interesting to to kids. I mean, why was it interesting? It wasn't interesting. You know, nobody yeah. talked about your family tree. You know, I've never heard the word. You know, unless unless you were the daughters of the American Revolution or something. You know, nobody talked about that kind of stuff. You were Americans. I mean, that was the the whole idea is that you wanted to be an American. You didn't want to worry about. Europe about <coughs> about all that stuff. Yeah. Well, did you have them? Um, what What was your relationship like? Did you know your grandparents? I only knew one. I didn't know. I didn't know my mother's parents at all because I told you I was born. I was named after them. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know them at all. My 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 father's parents had a very stormy relationship. Evidently, my grandfather was a kind of a, a difficult guy to get along with. He had a bad temper. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so my, 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 my grandparents, my father decided that my grandmother should come and live in New Orleans. So they, they never got divorced. They, he just, she, just, she just came to live in New Orleans. And... I remember, the only thing I remember was going to her apartment one time and seeing some little figurine somewhere. And she died when I was about two and a half or three. So I have no real memory of her. But my grandfather, at some point when I was about maybe four or five, came to live in New Orleans with us in our house. And uh, it was very stormy. He liked me. Um, but he, he was very, he was, like I say, whether he was suffering from some kind of dementia at this point, but he was very difficult to get along with. He insulted this, this woman, Zetta, who worked for us, called her a black something, a black witch or something. And she got very incensed. She chased him around the table with a broom and, uh, Oh, she was, she was, she, she, I could tell you, I could spend a lot of time talking about her anyway. And, uh, and then he, he started after my mother. He said, he said to, to somebody that she, he rescued her from a brothel. And, <laughs> and uh, that she was a prostitute in Memphis and he rescued her from a brothel. Uh, and I remember one episode when my mother <clears throat> in the summer <clears throat> came home from playing tennis. She was a great tennis player. That, see, there you go. She was a great tennis player. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Eli, she won the Memphis doubles. Really? The whole city. Yeah. In wow. 19, 
20 something. I even have her medal. That, that's, that must be where I get it from. Must right? be, must be, must <laughs> be. So uh, she came home from playing tennis and she was very hot. And what she used to do, and this is, this is something you might think about, when you're very hot, uh, instead of drinking, well, you have to drink, but don't drink real cold water, but take cold water and ice cubes and run it on your wrist. And it cools you down very quickly. So she got out a, a tray of ice cubes. Of course, the refrigerator didn't have an ice maker. It just had the, have you ever seen a tray of ice cubes? You've yeah. probably never seen it. Tray of ice, it, an ice cube tray? What? An ice cube tray? It's what? Now, what what'd you ask if I'd ever seen an ice cube tray? Yeah. No, we have those. Yeah, I've seen them. You've seen them? Yeah. So it was a, it was a long metal thing, yeah. and it had... It had a metal thing and it divided, it had little dividers in it and it had a lever. And when you wanted to get the ice out, you picked up the lever and everything came out. Do you have one like that? Yeah, yeah, no. we do. Yeah. You do? Really? Yeah. Why? Well, it doesn't have the lever, but it, it, we have a tray. Really? You just twist it. Yeah. You, your refrigerator doesn't make ice? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So this was a metal tray and it had the little dividers in it. And it had a little lever and you picked up the lever and all the ice popped out. So she went to the refrigerator. I still can see it. And she got, she got um, the tray out and she started rubbing the ice on her wrist. And he must have come in the room, the kitchen, and said something to her. And I guess it was just, just too much. And so she picked up the, the ice and, and threw it at him. And... <laughs> So I guess she said to my father, this is it. I can't do this anymore. And, uh, and by the way, he shared the bedroom with my brothers. They had a bedroom. And so there were three of them in this one bedroom. Now, can you imagine this? Oh, boy. Okay. So they, had, they each had a bed. And I remember this bed, his bed was across a, against another wall. It was a pretty good-sized room, I guess. And, um, and so, uh, and he had some kind of ulcers or something on his legs. And every night he would, he would take this stuff called noxema, which was a menthol kind of salve. I guess you can still buy it. It was an old fashioned thing. And he would swab it on his, you know, on his legs. And then he would wrap his legs in some kind of a, a gauze or something. And the smell just overwhelming. And so my brothers, my brothers always talked about the Noxema and Grandpa Harris. And, and the other episode with Grandpa Harris was that sometimes they would take a tennis ball in the house, if it was, I guess if it was raining or something, and just throw the ball against the wall and catch it. You ever done that? Yeah. Okay. Sure. And so one time they were doing that and he must have been in, in the room in the bed or something and it hit him on the head. And, and uh, I don't know whether they did it on purpose or as an accident. I don't know. But uh, my father is furious and maybe even spanked them. Um, he used to spank them. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> anyway, those are things I remember my grandfather, not, nothing, nothing very good. Yeah. So he was a, he was, he was a difficult person from what, from what everything I, I know about him and everything I remember about him. Yeah. And, um, so unfortunately I don't have any great memories of, of, of my grandparents. Well, luckily I have great memories of mine. So. Yeah. You, you're very lucky. You're very <laughs> lucky to to have had grandparents. I always yeah. miss that. People talked about, you know, Christmas and things like that and visiting their grandparents and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't, just wasn't part of, of my life. That's all. Yeah. Um, and so we will do three more questions and then we'll, I'll ask all the other ones like another time. Okay. Um, so uh, you said you had um, a lot of things you could say about, uh, about uh, Zeta. About Zeta? About Zeta. 
Yeah. And I was like, why not share a few things that you remember about her? Okay. So she came to work for my parents when they, they hadn't been in New Orleans. I guess Uncle Joe was maybe, I don't know, six or eight months old. She was a woman who had come from, from up in the country in Louisiana. She used to tell us that her father was a Cherokee Indian. So maybe she was mixed, you know, black and, and Native American. She wasn't real black. Uh, she was attractive. Uh, she wasn't fat. Like, you know, you see pictures of mammies, you know. You, know yeah. what, you ever heard the expression mammy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. She always was very careful about the way she looked um, and told, always used to tell me, you can't look sloppy, she used to tell me. Uh, and really, you know, we just, we all just grew up with her because, you know, my, parent, my father was at work all day. And if they ever went out of town together, she always stayed with us. And she even, my father built a, a room and a bathroom for her in the backyard. So she had her own house and she lived there um, when we were little. Um, she took care of us. She, it was a hard life for her. When I look back at it, you know, it was really hard. She, she, when, when I first knew her, when I, when I look back, she wasn't married. I think what had happened is that she had had a child out of wedlock out in the country somewhere. and. Uh, it wasn't very well accepted at that moment. And so she left the, the child with somebody, a relative maybe, and came to the city, you know. And uh, so we were her children. And, you know, she didn't mind disciplining us. And, you know, if we were doing something she knew was not right, she, she'd tell you. Uh, um, I mean, she never, she never hit us or anything, but, uh, she, uh, she was really almost like a second mother in many ways. Uh, but, but there was this great divide, you know, we knew she worked in the house and, and, um, you know, we knew we, we, we had, we couldn't, we, we could never, uh, use the N word. Not that I ever heard my parents using that word, but that was absolutely positively forbidden. Uh, we had to respect her. Um, she had a mind of her own. Here's a, here's a funny incident. <clears throat> Somebody, one time we had guests in the house and they brought my mother as a little gift, a bell. Now in, you know, in, in olden times when you wanted to, to summon the servant, you rang this little bell, okay? And they came and, you know, whatever. So this person gave my mother this little crystal bell. So one Friday, she, she was always there during dinner. She washed the dishes after dinner. She worked really, really hard. Anyway, she never cooked, but she, but she did everything else. So, uh, so one, one time after my mother got this bell, she decided she was going to use it one Friday night. So she's sitting there at the head of the table and she rings this bell. And Zetta comes into the dining room and she says, Miss Harris, I ain't no cow. Uh, that was the last time my mother used the bell. Uh, uh, she was fairly illiterate. I remember her asking me to write a letter for her. Um, you know, I don't remember, I don't know who it was to, but I remember her asking me to write letters for her. Um, she was devoted to her church. Uh, she was a member of something called the Usher Board. And that was a big, a big, a big thing in black churches. I think it still is. And they always wear white. You know, you see sometimes gatherings in Christian black churches, everybody, all the women wearing white, like uniform things. And sometimes they have hats and whatnot. And, uh, and they always had a, 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 a handkerchief in their, a flowered handkerchief in the pocket of, of, the, of the dress. And uh, I remember one time 
I had to, I get her, I got her a Christmas present and it was a big flowered handkerchief to go on her usher board uniform. Uh, she was, she was very smart, um, but fairly illiterate. Uh, I, I think she could barely read, but I don't think she could, she probably had maybe second, third grade education, but she was still smart. Uh, during the, 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 when, when, when my older siblings were born and they were <coughs> very, uh, in the, in the midst of the great depression of the 1930s, the late 1930s. And my father said he couldn't afford her anymore. Not that they were paying her a lot of money, but whatever. So he told her that, that he told my mother that he, he, she had to fire her, that, that he couldn't afford it anymore. And so my mother told her that, that, you know, she couldn't work there anymore. And so she goes to my father and she says, Mrs. Harris just fired me. And so he said to her, well, you know, Zada, it's not that she fired you, but, you know, things are really tough and we can't afford to have you anymore. And so she looked at him and she said, well, I'll just work for free. And when, when, you, can, when you can, you can pay me back. She was so loyal to, to the family, uh, well above her own, her own interest, because we were her life, really, we were her life. And so this, they, I'm sure they did, you know, pay her back when things got better. Um, but, uh, you know, in thinking back on it, it was such a hard life. You know, the, all, the, all the great things we have now, uh, washing machines, dryers, uh, wa dishwashers, uh, just everything. You know, things that we just think are just absolute essentials. None of that existed. Now, we did have a washing machine uh, later on. We did have, but, but not the kind of washing machine that you have. It was a washing machine that had a, a motor, of course, and a tub. And then to, 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 to wring out the clothes, you rolled this thing, two rubber rollers, so you, you fed the clothing, the wet clothing out of this tub into the rollers and you rolled it, you rolled it, you know, until it got, got fairly dry. And then you had to hang it up on the line outside. So we had clotheslines in the backyard. But uh, before that, she would build a fire in the backyard. We had a big backyard and she'd build a fire to get the water hot and wash the clothes on a washing board. Have you ever seen a washboard? You know what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you would just sit there with your hands and a piece of soap and rub the clothes over this board. And that's the way you wash clothes. Now, there were six people in this house. There was no wash and wear, you know, dry, you know, everything had to be washed and then hung on a line, then ironed. I mean, it was... It was hard work. It was really hard work. Yeah. Um, and so final two questions. Um, first one is, uh, what was your, uh, your favorite food as a kid? G Grandpa actually told me in his interview that um, he didn't know what good food was until he met you and your cooking. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, that's true. So obviously you grew up with some, some good food in your life. So I was wondering, what, what were some of your favorites? Well, uh, my mother's gumbo. I loved it. Um, she made she made something a Hungarian dish called paprika kitchen, capri paprika chicken, chicken and rice. It was it was chicken and rice. That was one of my favorites. Um, uh, I don't know. Everything she made was good. Uh, as I say, during the war, you didn't have, you didn't have a lot of meat. You didn't have hardly any meat. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what, but then, <clears throat> then when meat became plentiful, every once in a while we'd had a steak, you know, a real, a real steak. I mean, that was, that was an, an occasion. Red beans and rice, of course we had, and, uh, you know, all the Cajun dishes that she just made kosher, you know, she just, 
figured out a way that that uh, that they were kosher and and uh, we had a lo- we had a lot of different food we had a lot of fish you know fish was pretty plentiful um, we didn't have a lot of typical Jewish food I'd never heard of a bagel uh, I remember going to the kosher place and we had rye bread I remember rye bread and we 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 we, we had we never ate white bread. This was funny. You know, plain old Gentile white bread. So when I was in grammar school, when I went to this local public school, uh, the kids used to bring this white bread lunches, you know, bring their lunches. And I just thought that was that was the living end because we never had white bread in our house because I think there was lard in it. And so my mother never bought it. So she brought, you know, whatever, whatever the things were. We had a lot of French bread, you know, New Orleans French bread, baguettes. We had a lot of that. And we had rye bread and we had, I remember black pumpernickel bread. Um, <clears throat> I never heard of a bagel or lox. Um, we had kefilte fish because she made it from scratch. Um we had chopped liver. We had, you know, those those kinds of things that you made at home, but but uh, you you didn't buy that stuff anywhere. So I had a lot of we had a lot of different kinds of food. She was a great cook, um, and uh, so I, it's hard to say what was my absolute favorite food. I guess maybe the Hungarian chicken and rice maybe was one of my favorites. I don't know. So we had we had a tradition in our house that when it was your birthday, you would tell mother what you wanted and she would cook, you know, whatever it was you asked for. So I imagine I used to ask for chicken paprika most of the time, I guess. I I don't remember. But that was that was one of the perks of having a birthday is that you could ask uh for her to fix whatever it was you wanted. Um yeah. We rarely had birthday parties, you know. I don't ever remember going to a birthday party, you know, like like we do now, like you like you did when you were little. Like I say, we lived away from from most of the Jews and and uh uh it was just very different. It was it's quite different from, from your life for sure. And different from your father's life too. You know, quite yeah, a bit of difference. Of Very different. Um, and so my, my final question yeah. is um I asked this to grandpa too. Um what's your uh, your top five list of the places you've traveled? The top the top fast list of travel. Oh, okay. Well, absolutely number one was Antarctica. That was number one. Okay. Uh what? I know I said that, that's interesting because Grandpa said number one was clearly for him Israel. Oh, okay. I'm not going to even count. I'm not going to count Israel because that's just sort of a, a given. But I'm <laughs> okay. talking about I'm talking about you know kind of exotic travel. Uh, number one was was uh, <clears throat> uh, <coughs> uh, Antarctica. Uh, the most important uh, trip was Russia on my life. Um, uh, going down the line, as far as just recreational travel, um, let's see, what else would I say? Um, uh, so many to choose from, you know? What? So many to choose from. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot to choose from. Um, Iceland was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, Normandy, going to Normandy, that was that's that's way up there. That was because you know, I I, I lived through it. You know, because by the time D Day came, I was like nine years old. And so I was old enough to know what was going on. And so that was, that was a big event. No, I'm going, going to Normandy was very special. Um, just for scenery. Ah, uh, let's see. I'm just trying to think. 
I guess Japan, Japan was, was uh, Japan and China, you know, going to Asia is very, 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 very wonderful. Um, is that five? I think that's four. That's four. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I kind of put Japan and China in the same, <clears throat> in the same place. Uh, of course, you know, we went to China twice. We went to China when it was very communist in 1981. And then we went to China again, uh, I don't know, a number, a couple of years ago. So it was like going to a different country. It was going like, it wasn't even the same country anymore. And uh, oh, and the other, the other great trip, the other really scenic thing was, was going to Denali Park in Alaska. You know, the, the cruise was, was, was fine, but Denali Park uh, <clears throat> and driving a, 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 riding on a train, uh, you know, one of these uh, dome trains from Denali to Anchorage, was just just really phenomenal. So is that five yet? That's five. That's five. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> ask Jonathan <clears throat> to show you a little booklet that I wrote a number of years ago about about my grandparents. I I sent it to the, to all the grandchildren who were the who were old enough I thought to appreciate it. And I have a couple of extra copies, but I don't. I've been looking for them to send one to Sharona and one to you, but I don't know where they are. But Jonathan has one. And so it's a little, a, a little booklet, and it was a history of, of uh, my mother's parents and, and, my, and my parents, uh, all about them. So okay. ask, him, ask him if he knows where it is. I know I sent him one, and I've been looking all around to find the other two that I saved, one for you, <laughs> and one for Sharona. And for some reason I can't find him, but he, I don't know whether he knows where his is, but it's there. So it would probably answer a lot of other questions that you might have. Yeah. 